Hello everyone, welcome to uh, hopefully a quicker review today. Uh, we're going to be discussing a film that was selected uh, to honor this week was film icon uh, Martin Scorsese's birthday. And so we're going to be talking about one of his films. Now I had a bit of difficulty uh, actually choosing which film to discuss uh, because there's so many. The Irishman on Criterion Blu-ray is still uh, not released yet. That should be coming in like in a week and a half or so. And so I planned on talking about uh, one of his more popular films, Goodfellas, which I have here on the Steelbook version. I mean, just look at that. That is, that is swag. But uh, in the end, I didn't have time to rewatch it since it's, you know, three hours long. And I didn't have time for this. I want for this. I would have done a more in-depth review, and I didn't have time to outline. This week kind of slipped by me, and so instead, today we are going to be discussing the 1976 film Taxi Driver. Now, if you know me, or if you've been watching this channel for long enough, you know this is uh, my favorite Scorsese film, as well as one of my uh, favorite films. For a while it was, you know, up there like top three level. Now, uh, it's probably still top ten, but I wouldn't say, you know, even top five. Uh, and I didn't want to talk about this uh, for several reasons. One, I didn't have time to rewatch it this week, or even recently. But I mean, I've, I've seen it enough times, I, I, I'm confident I'll be able to talk about it. But I also didn't want to talk about it uh, on this series, at least, because I feel like talking about a film that I love as much as I do this, uh, it'd be hard to discuss without getting into, you know, like, cringe territory. And it would be hard to stay, like, in objective, like, critical tone as I did with the previous two videos. Um, and also, thirdly, I don't want to discuss, like, super popular movies on this, and I feel like this borders on being uh, more mainstream. So I'm going to keep this a lot more uh, brief and uh, sort of overview-like, because I, I mean, I assume more people have seen something like this than, uh, you know, Hexen or Simone Barbet, so I feel like uh, I'm not gonna get into two- this is on Netflix, I think, even, so yeah. Uh, no excuse. No excuses. So all of that said, on the other hand, I feel like it is important for me to talk about this, because I feel like it is uh, one of Scorsese's more misunderstood films, and misunderstood both by the people that really like it and the people that don't like it at all. And some of you probably already know what I mean by that. I feel like there's a lot of uh, confusion about this for some reason, so I'm just gonna go ahead and spell it out. Uh, you're not supposed to like Travis Bickle. You're not supposed to relate to him. He is supposed to be an incredibly mentally ill and dangerous person. <laughs> He is not supposed to be someone who you are supposed to find, oh, he's just like me! I'm watching this movie and he's just like, he's literally me! And so I think this is where the confusion comes in. This is not a film about a man who is uh, isolated by society. He's not a good person that's just thrown into this sick, oh, it's the society that's pushing him to be this way. It is about a person. It's not about, it's not a film about loneliness. It's a film about self-imposed loneliness. Travis Bickle is an incredibly self-destructive character. And if the reason you like this film is because you feel like he uh, embodies your loneliness, then <laughs> I have some really bad news for you. Because really this film isn't like a criticism on society. I mean it is, but it's a lot more complex than just, oh look at look at how poor Travis is treated by everybody. Why does nobody like me? But really overall it's a very complex and detailed uh, character study on this man who is so out of touch with reality and so incredibly like out of his mind, essentially. Well, not out of his mind, but incredibly mentally ill. He has a lot of issues. And yet, somehow, he's still able to function in society. He has a job. He's, well, especially at the ending, he's sort of uh, able to flourish, even. He's hailed as a hero by the ending. And he's able to, you know, charm uh, Betsy. I don't want to get, you know, too deep into any of this. Because uh, I could go on and on and on about this. Because it's one of my favorite movies. And that's what I kind of want to avoid for this. Because of how sort of caught up with, <laughs> with sort of myself in this movie and all that. And so I don't want to, like, uh, make this cringe. I just want to sort of briefly talk about this. 
And again, I didn't want to do this. I was I was forced. I didn't I didn't have a choice. But I wanted to talk about uh, three more things before we end this, because again, want to keep this brief. Uh, I'm going to talk about Paul Schrader, who's the writer, uh, Scorsese, because <laughs> obviously, and uh, the score, the Bernard Herrmann score. So I want to talk about Paul Schrader and his uh, mindset going into this film, writing it. Uh, because he, on the commentary track on this uh, Blu-ray, uh, he talks about, it's incredibly an, an illuminating uh, commentary track. It's him, Scorsese, and I think it's just them, actually. It cuts back and forth. And uh, he talks about uh, uh, his mind, the, where he was mentally uh, going in to write this. Um, he talks about how, like, he was at a point where he had moved to LA doing like movie stuff, I don't know. And he had, but he was like not interacting with anyone. He was like just doing his job, doing his work from home. And he would sort of ride around just in a car just to get out. And he would just sort of drive around. And then he had like some stomach issue and there was some thing. He had to go into the ER to get some operation or something was wrong with him. And he sort of realized while he was there that he hadn't spoken to anyone in like three weeks. And so he sort of took that uh, mind space and turned it, not that he's writing about himself. Again, stop championing uh, Travis Bickle in this. That is not <laughs> what I am saying, but I'm saying that uh, Schrader was able to take that experience. And like I said, he would drive around. And so he sort of used the taxi cab as sort of this uh, metaphor for like a I think he called it like a metal coffin that sort of navigating through these like nightmarish streets of New York. And it is such a tightly constructed script. I recommend uh, you guys, because I've watched this film countless times and I also read the script, the screenplay, uh, which you, if you didn't know, like you can find pretty much every uh, screenplay just on the internet. I think it's uh, IMSDB. Dot com has a bunch of scripts pretty much every movie you could think of just type it in and it'll come up uh, Anyway, I recommend you all read this script especially because of how Interesting it is to see the difference of what is included what is specified in the script versus what actually shows up in the movie uh, I think good example of this is in the script or in the movie rather there's a scene where you sort of see Travis's room for the first time, and you sort of go through and you see all, it's like trash, there's everything, and then you see, it's missable in the movie, but if you read the script, it's just like, he, we, he's just, the script describes uh, what's in the room, and it's just the messy, there's bottles everywhere, you know, there's medication, stuff like that. But one of the few things that they specify in the script is that he has a full-size, like, Vietnamese flag. And there's definitely, that's where I think the societal commentary uh, you can dig into there. Because that's specified in the script and it's almost missable in the movie. Like I didn't notice it until I read that in the script. And so I think you can dig into like societal criticisms in that sense. And where uh, the isolation sort of is a societal issue. And how he is uh, forced in this state of violence that there's only one way this film really could have ended. And keeping on that statement, uh, I wanted to talk about some of the things that people might be confused about, such as the self-imposed loneliness versus just his loneliness because of society. Uh, he is an incredibly self-destructive and hypocritical person. He, constant, he constantly throughout the film uh, says that he has these monologues, his diary entries or whatever, he talks about how he hates the filth of the street. He hates all the junkies, the bums, the drunks. He hates all of them. And yet he gets a job as a taxi driver. And he specifically works the nights. And he specifically goes on the streets that he knows will be surrounded by all of the filth and the people that he knows that he hates. And so it's like, if he really has such an issue with them, then why would he surround himself only with... Um, you know, people like that. And also, he's, and also, it's extra hypocritical, because he's always talking about the junkies and, you know, the alcoholics and everything. But then the whole movie's taking pills and drinking. And so it's like, the fact that people can watch this movie <laughs> and think that, like, Travis Bickle is some, like, tragedy. He is such, 
he's but the point isn't that he's like an idiot it's not some like hidden comedy that's not what i'm saying it's just that he's so mentally ill and out of touch that he can't recognize what he's doing. He can't recognize his own undoings and his own hypocrisies. So now I want to talk about uh, the reason we're talking about this, uh, Martin Scorsese. Or Scorsese, I mean, I don't think it really matters. He says his name is Scorsese, so I don't see why I shouldn't say that. But um, anyway, he directed this film, and this was sort of a, not necessarily a turning point, but it sort of uh, solidified his career uh, as sort of a champion of the filmmaker. So now I'm going to kind of get away from this film a bit and talk about the larger context of Scorsese's career. Um, this was his fifth film, fifth feature film. And his first one, no one really talks about. It was uh, Who's That Knocking at My Door? Uh, but the second one, Boxcar Bertha, that's the one that got the attention of film critic Roger Ebert. And I believe his quote was that uh, he sort of, the energy that it had, the sort of like explosive violence, he sort of, I think the quote was, uh, he has the potential to become the American Fellini. And so that prophecy of sorts was almost immediately fulfilled with his uh, third film, Mean Streets, which uh, I <laughs> really like a lot. I know some people, I mean, it has its flaws and everything. But for what it is, I think it's amazing, and I really love it. I would talk about that film, but uh, I wanted to talk about this more. So almost immediately, I mean, obviously, Martin Scorsese, that's like a household name. I mean, he's beyond, I mean, obviously, he's more popular than Fellini ever was. And I mean, in terms of, like, film history and the impact he has had is uh, beyond even expressible by... I would say almost incomparable to anyone else because not only is he such a respected filmmaker, he's also, I would almost say I respect him more as a film appreciator, a film expert, you know, I feel like, which is saying a lot because, you know, he's made so many masterpieces over the years. And so with his fourth film out of the way, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, he definitely has risen to this uh, status as a up-and-coming legendary director of Hollywood. And so now the sort of his decision is do I go with these big studio movies with these large budgets and the very, you know, safe scripts, or do I go with this less safe stranger script written by Paul Schrader and do some sort of lower budget weird stuff? And I think uh, throughout his career that choice to make this still has its ramifications today because, I mean, everyone thinks of him, you know, oh, he's the Goodfellas guy, oh, Wolf of Wall Street, but then no one ever talks about something like, you know, After Hours or something weird like Shutter Island. And so I think this was sort of the first uh, big departure from that uh, safe career path that he could have gone down. And sure, maybe we'd, we would have more Goodfellas out there, but... Also, I feel like his weirder stuff, as I mentioned, he's sort of the champion of the small filmmaker. He is, in a lot of ways, those weirder stuff probably have inspired just as many people as his Goodfellas stuff. And so getting back to Taxi Driver, I feel like this film, he really uh, went full experiment. Like, he really went with the weirdness in a lot of ways. He sort of worked. I mean, obviously, Robert De Niro, I should mention, all of the performances in this are really good uh, to great. Uh, Robert De Niro and, and Martin Scorsese obviously work <laughs> really well together. I don't know if you've noticed, they've actually done a couple of collaborations. I know he's sort of a smaller actor, but especially in the editing and sort of the presentation, obviously there's the famous uh, like camera move down the hallway, like the unprompted move, and you're sort of waiting, like, is there going to like, in a lesser film, you would think, oh, is this gonna, is there gonna be an explosion? Is someone gonna walk in? What's happening? But no, we just move to the hallway away from Travis, and then just, there he goes, walking right down the middle of the frame. And it's so uh, well made, and it was shot very quickly as well. Uh, as I said, this was sort of a smaller production, and... I mean, it really shows how much he cares. I mean, obviously the setting, New York, I mean, that's something Scorsese cares a lot about, a lot of the sort of accuracy of the streets. In fact, I, <laughs> there's sort of a funny story he mentioned, uh, like 
they had Robert De Niro actually work as a taxi driver in sort of preparation for the role. And this was right around, this is right after he won the Oscar for <laughs> Godfather 2. So one of the people that got in the cab like recognized him and he was like, wow, is, is Hollywood really that bad? You have to <laughs> work as a taxi driver. And so I think that is a good uh, testament to the sort of passion, because this was sort of a passion project of sorts uh, in comparison to something like, you know, his next film, New York, New York. I mean, this is not a, like, big studio movie, you know? And sort of one last thing in terms of the uh, filmmaking. Uh, well, no, I lied. <laughs> I want to mention the editing as well, the sort of, like, experimental uh, editing at times, where it's, like, the jump cuts, the repeats, the repeats. And he works very close. I don't know if many people know this. He works very close with the editing department. Uh, he talked about this. I think it was... He was talking about... Uh, Orson Welles' final film, The Other Side of the Wind, and he's talking about how good editing comes down to just a matter of frames, or not frames, single frames. One second too long or one second too short uh, can really affect the effectiveness of a scene. And so he's very much a uh, involved in the post-production aspects. And so all of those jump cuts and the way that it's edited, that's very much, that's not just they send it off to some studio. This very, that is Scorsese in the editing booth. And then one last thing I want to talk about, the ending sequence. Now, I don't know if this is sort of easily recognizable, but the ending has a almost like, almost like sepia uh, filter over it. Not filter, but look. And this is because of censorship, because obviously spoilers, but there's a big shootout at the ending where Travis sort of, like I mentioned, there's only one way this sto a story like this could end. But uh, in terms of censorship, uh, I think this adds to the effectiveness. This is a good way to get like around censorship. You add it into the thing. And so what he ended up doing was 40% black and white, 60% color, like regular film. And I think he like wanted to, like after seeing that, he wanted to do like the whole film <laughs> shot like that. I think he even mentioned like black and white at one point. But uh, if you rewatch it, uh, knowing that, you can definitely tell like the stark difference between the way it looks before that sequence and then after. And you can tell how like it's sort of almost like brownish, almost like on the, uh, like that color-ish. I mean, that's a bit more yellow, I think. But y you can definitely tell what I'm talking about uh, for that sort of shootout sequence. And so I think that's a really not only cool like detail, and it definitely adds to like the sort of this is the very much an explosive climax, and it adds to that sort of like nightmarish, almost uh, I guess in a way surreal like layer. Like this is happening. This is the ending to this story, and obviously spoilers again, but <laughs> it's not the ending. And so one last, th and so to wrap things up. Uh, I've already been recording way, way too long. So to wrap things up really quick, Bernard Herrmann score. So Bernard Herrmann, a uh, very legendary, perhaps one of the absolute uh, most well-known uh, composers in film, uh, most notably for his work with Hitchcock. Uh, he did the score for Citizen Kane. And his very final score before his passing was for this. And not only is this one of his finest scores, but it also adds so much to the film. And that's not to say that, like, uh, not to any uh, insult to Schrader or Scorsese. Scorsese very much insisted that Herman's uh, do this film. And <laughs> I th there's a they talk about in the commentary track that, like, it was very difficult getting him for this film. And there is lots of sort of arguing as to the usage of the music, where it is and isn't, and sort of back and forth. And you sort of realize, like, oh, this, it, it like, complements uh, Herman's career so much. It, like, is a perfect way to, I mean, tragically end his career. But, uh, it, but it fits so perfectly as, like, a final score by Bernard Herman. But um, you sort of realize, oh, <laughs> they didn't know that this was his final score. He didn't know. And so there's a lot more bickering than you might like to think. And I mean, the score is just so perfect. It adds so much to the atmosphere, to the sort of tension, to the building, the repetition. And it is like just that main theme going over and over and over, droning on in the background. Not droning. It's a very beautiful score. But it's such, it has such presence and it gives life and it makes the city. I talked about this uh 
I did a video on, I have the vinyl of the soundtrack and I sort of talk about the music, but it creates almost like, it gives life to the city and almost makes it the city its own character, which it is essentially. And I think especially uh, the score with the ending, I mean, this ending, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's essentially the perfect ending to arguably a perfect film. At least you can admit the ending is spot on with the adjustment to the mirror. I mean, it's such like, a, and that sound effect with the mirror, again, Scorsese in the editing. And it's so powerful and intimidating and ominous because, I mean, nothing has been learned. Nothing has been gained. We are exactly where we were at the beginning. And sort of this timer in Travis's head, like, it's only a matter of time before he does something like this again. And, you know, next time probably uh, the society won't be so forgiving of him. And it's just such, like, just like, just like that, the timer in his head just restarts and it's just counting down for when he does this exact thing again. And I think that's such the perfect ending with this perfect soundtrack. And I mean, I just love this film. I, I, <laughs> there's no, there's nothing else to talk about. I love this film. And I hate the people that don't get this film. It really bothers me. And I mean, I keep bringing it up because, I mean, I love this film and there's so much about this film to love and it just bothers me that, you know, there are people that uh, don't love, that love this film or hate this film for the wrong reasons. And I think one of the reasons, I mean, what's up with this Blu-ray cover? It makes them look like some criminal or something. You know, this looks, this looks like the cover for Cape Fear more than Taxi Driver. I mean, what's wrong? The theatrical poster is so good. Like, I don't get, and that's why I feel like it's marketed as like, oh, look at this badass Travis Bickle, Robert De Niro, Martin Scorsese. And uh, keeping on that in the Blu-ray, I still, I still really like this Blu-ray a lot, by the way. I'm just saying the cover is a bit questionable. Uh, it comes with a bunch of posters. Or little, like, card-sized posters. But then there's some of these, I'm looking at them. <laughs> I'm wondering, like, what's the type of person that's gonna hang this up? Or who's gonna put this on their wall? Or what about this? I mean, is this not concerning? I mean, the, the worst one is this. <laughs> who's gonna put this on their wall? And so I feel like uh, that sort of plays into a lot of the misconceptions. This is sort of marketed as this sort of, like, uh, gritty and dark thing, when re in reality, it is very dark, but it's not because of, like, it's not in a cool way. And so like I said, uh, this film I could go on and on about, and I have, I am reaching one hour in the recording, which is longer than either of the two previous recordings of this kind that I've done, which is so cool because I wanted to be done with this in 20 minutes and here I am one hour in still talking. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, I did want to just do this really quick. Uh, I didn't even have an outline for this, so that's probably why I wanted to do this really quick in honor of the legendary Martin Scorsese. I mean, one of the most influential figures in film, not just directors, but figures, as I said, like a cultural icon. I mean, we can all agree that one of the best parts of 2020, <laughs> Bong Joon-ho's acceptance speech mentioning uh, Martin Scorsese, and he's sort of like chuckling in the crowd. But then again, I could also go on and on talking about Scorsese. So I'm just gonna end the video End it now. Uh, Taxi Driver, go watch it. It's on Netflix, I think. It got removed for a while. I think it's back on. Uh, just watch this film, but please don't relate to Travis. Uh, also watch King of Comedy, After Hours. Just watch all of Scorsese's movies, okay? Please, thank you, thank you, thank you.